As we uh, come to God's word, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are our God. Thank you for your extraordinary love for us and generosity shown to us. Father, we pray as we spend time in your word this morning that you would give us insight and understanding. And that you would give us clarity of who you are and what you're doing in the world. And that you would give us confidence to trust in you, uh, to lead us in our lives as people, as a church, uh, as a universal church in a world that has rejected you and is rejecting you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, the story I'm telling myself is that following God is easy. A book that I'm reading at the moment talks about the idea of being resilient. And one of the ways to be resilient is to face up to the reality of life and the lies that we tell ourselves or try to convince ourselves of. So one way to grow resilience is to write down or tell someone the story that we're telling ourselves. So if I was to get negative feedback from one person on one sermon, I may decide and start telling myself a story that I'm a terrible preacher and I should never preach again. Because obviously everybody hates my preaching and I've been wasting my whole life devoting my attention to this. Now this might seem like a complete overreaction to one piece of feedback from one person, even uh, when it flies in the face of most of the feedback I get on my preaching. So there's, there's no need to send me a note or anything about my preaching in light of this introduction. Unless of course you feel compelled to, then feel free. Uh, but the story we tell ourselves as we deal with reality is often dealing with uh, what is real, but with the amplifier turned up. Someone didn't like the meal you cooked. Oh, I'm, I, 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 I'm a terrible cook. You catch the ball that is kicked to you and you think, oh, I'm amazing. I should be receiving $100 million a year to play in the NFL because I'm obviously that good. We can do it with both positives and negatives. But it's worth calling out and acknowledging that's what we're thinking so that we, we don't just uh, keep de dwelling on this skewed understanding of reality, but we investigate what's actually going on. How am I actually responding to what's going on in the world and what I'm actually dealing with? I think one of the things that the Western world, the Judeo-Christian Judeo world believes is that following God should come naturally. Even though we may not do it or really even know what God want, wants us to do, the truth we want to believe is that if I set my mind to it, I should be able to do it. We could, we could live God's way, but at the moment it it's not, doesn't really fit with what I'm doing. We want to believe that if God was explicit with us, then we would do things right. That's the story we tell ourselves as we think about the pe people being basically good. And even though some people do, are really bad, most people are actually good is, is the story we tell ourselves. And so we believe that, uh, that if God actually was clearer, then people would live in a godly way. In Joshua, God is explicit. Uh, and let's have a look today. We're going to look at a big chunk, chapters 6 to 8. Uh, there's a lot to it in it. Uh, but we, I want to look at how the people respond to God when he's explicit. So in chapter 6, we read, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city. All the men of war are going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout, all the people shout uh, with great, with, with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people should go up everyone straight before him. So the picture that is presented uh, at the, at the start of chapter six 
God says, I'm giving Jericho into your hand. And you, you might be thinking, well, this is quite a, uh, this is going to stretch Israel's faithfulness. Because God's plan for defeating the people of uh, Jericho and uh, who are stuck inside a walled city is to march around for a week blowing trumpets. Now, I used to play a trumpet as a kid, uh, and I'm more than aware of how annoying it can be. But the closest my trumpeting went to collapsing a wall was someone banging on the other side of it, telling me to be quiet. This is a very strange strategy for winning a war. But Joshua is leading God's people to follow, leading God's people to follow God's way. And so he says in verse six, so Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, go forward, march around the city uh, and let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. And that's exactly what they did. For six days, they went around once a day, blowing their trumpets. And then we read in verse 15, I'm jumping ahead. It says a lot in today. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within is within all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute uh, and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to, the, to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp for Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. Uh, but all, uh, all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasure of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout. And the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city every man straight before him and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, ox and sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. So Rahab and her family are rescued while everybody and everything else except what God has said are to be put in the treasury of the house of the Lord is destroyed. It seems like a harsh and instantaneous judgment against the people of Jericho, doesn't it? There are a whole lot of reasons for this. Uh, and I, I think it's worth taking a minor excursus here. I don't use that word very often away from the text uh, and consider why is it that God is comfortable with destroying this nation of people, the people of Cana, uh, the people of Jericho. Uh, we're going to see it again and again and again where nations are defeated and destroyed and a whole lot of people are killed off. Why is God doing this? Why is God judging these people? Is God just saying, well, you're, uh, you're truants in my people's land and removing them? Or is there more to it? So I want to take a, 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 a few minutes, which means we'll go a few minutes longer uh, on what's already a long sermon. But I think it's worth paying attention to what God is doing here. First thing I want us to, we need to recognize is that God's goal is to protect his people. His goal is to keep them untarnished by these other nations, to keep them his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, God told uh, Moses clearly, in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction. And he lists off the Hittites, the Amorites, all of those people that he's commanded. That, and the reason is that they may not teach you to do according to all their abom abominable practices that they have done for their gods. And so you sin against the Lord your God. His goal is to protect his people from the evil practices of the people who live in Cana. Uh, in Genesis 15 that we looked at uh, two weeks ago when we did the introduction, 
uh, God promised Abraham that his offspring would find themselves enslaved for 400 years. What you might not have noticed in that statement was when God said, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Okay, so just, let's just consider that statement for a moment. The Amorites were the people who lived in Cana in the promised land and their sin went on for more than 400 years. And when it reached its full measure, they as a nation would bear the consequence of 400, 500 years of sin. What's also worth recognising here is that there are hundreds of years for the, for the Amorites, for the people of Cana, to recognise their sin and turn to the true and living God, to repent. But they haven't. And now they are bearing the consequences. In Leviticus 18, God speaks to Moses. He says, You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall not follow. My, you shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. God makes it absolutely clear to Moses that they aren't to be like the Canaanites. They're not to go back to the way that the Egyptians lived. They're to follow him. The Canaanites are in that chapter, Leviticus 18, he goes on to explain uh, what the practices the Canaanites are like. Uh, which largely seem to be sexual practices. Uh, and it's pretty, um, that's kind of their worship. Their worship was uh, sexual. Their life was centred around uh, their sexuality and their sexual behaviour. Uh, it's important to recognise God's calling them to live his way. It's also important to recognise that these are not good folks. But the Israelites shouldn't think that they are good and everyone else is evil. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 5, he says, Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your father, to fathers, to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. It's not because the Israelites are good. And it's not because, well, it is because the Canaanites are evil. So they are being judged. judged. They are facing the consequences of what they have done. But uh, it's important to see that God wants his people to live as his people. He expects them to live in a way that pleases him. He knows that it doesn't come naturally. They're not saved because of their righteousness in the same way that we aren't but they are saved because they are chosen. They are God's chosen people. God made a promise to Abraham and he is following through with his promise. But the expectation is that they will live his way. The judgment that seems harsh was always the plan. And it was known for a long time. And in that time, there was opportunity for the people who are now facing judgment to repent. But they haven't. And so... Innocence, in inverted commas, are bearing the consequences uh, of a nation, nations who chose to reject God and ignore God. The expectation, though, in following through for the Israelites is they will follow through with God's plan. But as we'll see in chapter 7, they don't always do that. So we're back in Joshua now. Joshua chapter 7, right at the beginning, verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. You remember uh, when they said, go into Jericho, everything is to be burnt except the things that are to be devoted to God. The, the special things, the gold, the silver, the bronze. Uh, they are to be taken and put in, uh, given to God and devoted to God, but Achan has broken that rule. That's what God knows. Nobody else knows. So the people have failed to follow God's instructions, uh, and almost immediately they experience the consequences of that. Verse 2, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, 
which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out I. And they returned to Joshua and said, don't have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack I. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of I. And the men of I killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. You notice the melting hearts now belong to the Israelites. And Joshua expresses his upset to God, uh, rec recognizing that it's not the people of I that are to be feared, but it's God who is to be feared. The true and living God who's brought them to this land, who appears to be noticeably absent from the plans that saw Israelites' casualties be killed. You know, they didn't consult God before they went up. They just went, no, oh, I reckon only in a couple of thousand. And they experienced it. So he complains to God and said, why did you do this? We should have stayed on the other side of the Jordan. Why did you put us through this? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So jumping down to verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. God knows there's a problem and he won't have it. God will not accept his, his people failing to follow upon him. I will be with you no more unless you deal with this sin. It's time to act. Uh, it's time to act. It's time to remove the devoted things. It's time to deal with the sin that has been committed. So he tells the people to get ready because God says there are devoted things among you. And tomorrow we're going to find out who has stolen the things that were devoted to God. God tells Joshua exactly what to do. Uh, so verse 16. Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe. And the tribe of Judah was taken uh, and he brought near the clans of Judah and the clan of the Zerahites was taken and he brought them near the clan of the Zerahites man by man. And Zabdi was taken and he brought near his household by man by man. And Achan, the son of Kami, was taken. So God, by lots, like by chance, points out that it's Achan who does it. And Joshua said to Achan, verse 19, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I did. Achan, God... <laughs> Joshua says, Give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give him praise to him by telling the truth. Tell the truth now about what you've done. And he says he's sinned against God. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So they go and find the cloak, silver and gold, and they grab Achan and his whole family. And they kill them in what is a, a pretty awful picture of judgment. But it should remind us again of the seriousness with which God takes sin. That's what Achan called it. He sinned. I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And for that, he was punished. And because of that, well, actually, Israel, the whole of Israel had already been punished because 36 soldiers had already been killed. Sin impacts God. The impact of sin, the consequences of sin impact others. You may think that that's not fair, that God is being harsh or unreasonable. 
But what I think is worth pointing out is that God is being clear. Clear to his people that he's rescued. Clear to his people who he has uh, gone out of his way to rescue and rescue in extraordinary ways and to show them and everybody else that it is him who is doing it. And he demonstrates again and again the value of doing things his way and the danger of rejecting his way. So in chapter 8, we'll jump forward. In chapter 8, the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only spoil its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. There was not a, a so they go in, they ambush uh, the people of Ai. Uh, it's quite a good military story uh, of what goes on. Um, and they kill them all. And they kill the king. It's all pretty graphic. It's all pretty horrible. Joshua builds an altar made up of the, the right kind of stone. God's told him what to do. And he writes on the stones the words of the law. And he offers sacrifices to God on the altar. And then he gathers all the people of Israel around the Ark of the Covenant. And we read in verse uh, 35 of chapter 8, There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. So God, after they'd won this battle and they'd got their, the spoils, they gathered all together and Moses read the law to them. Uh, Joshua read the law to them. Joshua reminded them how to live as God's people. Joshua read to them how to be God's people. And they listened because God, and they all gathered around the Ark of the Covenant where God is present. So God is at the center of what God's people are doing. God is at the center of the way they are to live. God is at the center of their victory. God is at the center of their lives. What do we learn from these chapters? God wants his uh, people to live in the place that he is providing for them his way as his people. God takes sin very seriously. Hidden sin isn't hidden from God. Hidden sin isn't hidden from God. The way that God's people will receive God's land, the land that God is, give, is giving them, is by doing things his way. When they try to do things their way or what seems easier or better, uh, than, or better than God's way, will not be tolerated. God is providing them with the land that they have been waiting for, for 40 years in the desert, for hundreds of years of being while they were slaves in Egypt. All you have to do now is trust God and stick with the plan. It doesn't seem all that difficult, does it? God has showed himself to be God. Just follow him. It doesn't seem that complicated. And yet it is. Following God doesn't come naturally. Doing things my way comes naturally. Achan, you know, he saw this, uh, the, this beautiful cloak and the gold and the silver and he thought, I'd like some of that. I like it. He looked, he saw, he wanted and he took it and he hid it because he knew it was wrong. If he didn't know it was wrong, he wouldn't have hidden it. Friends, following God does not come naturally. Following God is not our natural state of being. It's the, it, was the same, it was the case for the Israelites and it's the case for us now. And we as followers of Jesus have a massive advantage over the Israelites. 
we can look at a much bigger picture of history. We have God's Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We have uh, God's word readily available for us to read and hear him speak whenever we like. Now, it's true, he doesn't necessarily provide us with specific things to do in the specific situation. You know, he doesn't say, go and march around your town uh, every day and then seven times on Sundays and everybody will follow, become followers of Jesus. He hasn't said that. Well, he hasn't said it to me anyway. He hasn't been specific in the way that he did in terms of the defeats of Jericho and I. But he has spoken. And he has spoken clearly about who we are as God's people. And where we, our home is. And where we are going. And what we are to do as we live as God's people in the place he has put us. God is setting up Israel to live as his people in the place that he has provided his way. And we, as Christians, have a home that we are waiting to go to. And we are now left to live as his people in the place that he has put us, in the way that he has called us to live, which we will fail to do many times. But we also know that the consequences of those failures to live God's way have been paid for by Jesus. So we live in the place that God has put us, waiting to go home with God's spirit inside us, with a clear way to live, knowing that God has forgiven us. So the call in Israel was to trust God. And the call on you and I today is to trust God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you indeed are the true and living God. Father, enable us to live as your people in the place that you've put us. Your way, bringing glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.